Now, which then means that uh, you know, which then means that we should be able to write down a convolution equation. Correct. I mean, linear shift invariance. That means one should be able to write down a convolution equation. So, so how do we how do we show that typically? So we say that you know, if you apply, uh, let's assume that we are looking at kind of a discrete case. Continuous will mean that you know to use a Dirac delta and all. Instead of that, we'll go with simply a, a Kronecker delta. Let's say delta m comma n, a Kronecker delta. We know right what it is. It has a height one, exists only at m equal to zero, n equal to zero. Right. So so delta m n if it goes in. See, I mean, right, there, there is a subtle notion. Uh, there is a small difference between impulse response and actually response to an impulse. Okay, so impulse response when somebody says, okay, they you know, typically mean that you have a system that is linear, time invariant, and so on. But somebody says response to an impulse, right? It could mean it could mean anything. It doesn't mean that uh, this system has, you know, has shift invariance or uh, time invariance and all that. It simply means that if I if I apply this impulse, what do I see as response? So that is response to an impulse. Impulse response is, is basically a special sort of special pair of words, you know, that are actually reserved only for only for LTI systems. Okay, so delta M N, let us say that it gives me some output, okay, which I call as H M N, and I'm going to put a semicolon zero comma zero just to indicate that this Kronecker is situated at m equal to zero, m equal to zero. Okay, so so this zero zero is to indicate that this impulse was applied at m at m equal to zero, m equal to zero. Okay, so this is like a response to an impulse. I see some H M N. Uh, you know, and then subscripted or you know as a function of zero comma zero. Now suppose I shift this Kronecker to some m prime n prime, and then and and as of now I don't assume linearity or anything. Nothing I assume. Then let us say right that this system then produces an H which again depends upon depends upon where the impulse is. Right? This is like a response to an impulse. So if you applied it at m equal to zero and equal to zero, I see some I I see I see this guy. When you apply it at m prime n prime, I see let's say this guy. So this is this is indexed by zero comma zero. This is indexed by m prime comma n prime. Okay. Now in general, okay, if you look at uh, if you look at any any f of m, m, m comma n, okay, why we talk about impulses because any signal can be can be say represented as scaled and shifted versions of impulse. So f of m n, what do we do? We can write this as double sum m prime n prime, f of m prime n prime, uh, and then delta, right, m minus m prime. N minus n prime. Now, now let me just mention that this is a Kronecker delta, is, okay? Because we are looking at a discrete case. It's called a Kronecker delta. Okay, so you can see this. No, so m prime m minus n prime. So you can see that uh, for all values m prime n prime not equal to m n, this will be zero. Only at m prime equal to m and n prime is equal to n is this one, and there you get f of m comma n. For all of the other values, this guy is zero. Therefore, therefore this is equal to f of m comma n on the left. Correct. This is the way we try to express any any general signal, right? In terms of impulses, we can we can amplitude the uh, we can amplitude scale by by this number and shift it by m prime n prime. So if this f m n goes here, okay, now because I can express it in terms of these impulses and all, right? Uh, this delta m minus m prime n minus n prime. So suppose I write f m n where I mean f m n is generated in that manner. Okay, then what it will mean is. The output, okay. If I assume that now, if I start to assume that I have actually a linear system, which which means that if all of these were to be were to be put individually or were they were they to be given simultaneously as f of m comma n individually, right? Each one of them would have would have, would have given me something. Now uh, suppose I put all of them together, but if my if I assume now that my system is linear, then you will get f of m prime comma n prime into h of m n semicolon m prime comma n prime. Correct. This is only if if you assume linearity. On top of this, okay, so f m n goes in, and then this is what comes out. Now, if f m n goes in, and if I say that's linear and shift invariant, also, okay, then, then, then what will it mean? So, if I shift m minus, if I shift my impulse to m prime n prime. Then my output should be just the same. This guy, except that it should become m minus m prime, n minus n prime, so let me call it zero comma zero. Correct. So this should give me summation f of m prime comma n prime h of m minus m prime n minus n prime semicolon zero comma zero. So the zero comma zero has no has no implications anymore. It has no more meaning. Only when it was uh, now when the shift invariance notion wasn't there, this had to be explicitly put every time. But now that if we assume that it is not only really linear but it is also shift invariant, then then f m n will lead to. So this is like showing an image. 
which could be focused or whatever epin hole focus we made then the output will look like f of m prime comma n prime into h f so this is all summed up over m prime n prime so because of the fact that 0 comma 0 has no role so we'll simply drop it and just write it as double sum m prime n prime okay and f of m prime comma n prime h f m minus m prime n minus n prime okay, so once you assume shift invariance this has no role and therefore can be dropped or this is the same as you know h of m prime comma n prime f of m minus m prime so this is the same as sum over okay whatever m prime n prime h of m prime comma n prime all of that holds okay whatever we have for the for the 1d situation right h convolution f is the same as f convolution and all that all of that will still hold okay so this is called actually a 2d convolution it's very simple to implement right you, you just uh, now okay uh, uh, earlier to that prior to that we'll we'll kind of look at some more things about this h itself okay uh, yeah and then and then we get to look at but but again but again imagine whatever you do with 1d in 1d what do you do suppose i gave you f the signal and then i gave you h the impulse response let's say impulse response is now let's assume that uh, we kind of flip the impulse response right so we'll uh, we'll do this h of minus m right uh, sorry minus whatever m prime okay in this case so you do you flip it and then you slide it and for every slide you compute whatever is the overlap multiply add that is your convolution same thing you have to do here also you have an image you have this h the only thing is you have to you have to you have to flip it both about x and y there it's only about about one dimension here it has to be flipped about both x and y dimensions you get the you get the flipped h and now you just you just the, you just have to slap it on on the on the on f and then slide it all over and wherever you keep it right that the image has some underlying values this h will have some values multiply both of them add them that will be the value at that point shift keep doing this right as, as simple as that so whatever you do for 1d the same convolution operation just that you will have instead of you know one dimensional kind of a, what you call kernel you will have a 2d kernel okay now uh, at this point of time right i want to take a small digression to just to look at this 1d lti systems again okay because because there are there are some nice things right that we would like to borrow from there again we'll uh, even when we do transforms and all we'll typically look at 1d and then come to 2d because 1d is something that you're all familiar with and then uh, and then it will be important to see how this how this would generalize okay you know when you actually look at an imaging system so look at a look at a 1d lti system let us say that i have i have a system right which takes whatever hm hn or whatever and you know, xm goes in and then ym comes out right now we know that uh, especially we are inter we are interested in really a discrete uh, system okay because images typically we deal with a discrete grid and so on so we'll just stick to a discrete case now we know that uh, we know that y of course can be expressed as x convolution h because it's lti we also know that you know this operation right can also be represented in terms of a matrix multiplying x okay and uh, and sometimes you know writing it in this matrix vector form throws a lot more gives you a lot more insight into what is going on rather than simply writing uh, writing this convolution equation so even for actually 2d we wrote a convolution equation so the idea is that if i had to write that again in a matrix vector form what would i get how would i write it because it looks like i have a, I have an image here and then the output is an image and then the and then in between i have an impulse response so how do i write the whole thing right how do i relate the input and the output but then prior to going there if we can understand how we do it here and then uh, uh, then then we can actually borrow some of the ideas from here to understand what goes on when you have a 2d case okay now during the so in order to show some things right on the out here we'll just we'll just take a very simple example because anything very complex and all you know we will be in writing a lot of stuff here and then it'll all it'll all scribble out so we will take a very simple case assume that assume that you know xn exists uh, okay i'm taking a very simple case okay um, let me say xn exists uh, for 0 less than n less than equal to 1 okay else it is 0 and then simply let me say hn 
okay also exists for 0 less than or equal to n less than or equal to 2 so so it's like saying that like saying that i have an xn which just has some value at 0 and 1 okay something it has and then afterwards it's all zero equivalently and similarly right xn is something okay, like that so i have hn okay maybe it is something like 0 1 and then this is hn okay something like that so we know that uh, so we know that when y will have a length uh, 3 right will have a length 3 because each has a length 2 will have a length 3 right 2 plus 2 minus 1 hmm? m plus n minus 1 so this guy will have a length 3 so if we if we start writing out suppose suppose i suppose i suppose I write down this convolution equation that we have here which is for this very simple case it will be like y of n is equal to summation over m let me say that this is over 0 to 1 right let me say hm hm xf what i am taking xf n minus m hmm. okay so what do we get we get like uh, uh, let me write it like this as h0 xn plus h1 xn minus 1 right for for n equal to 0 1 and of course length 3 and n will exist in this case from n will exist from 0 1 2 right because okay for this convolution okay now if i write y0 okay now instead of writing it in this form i'm going to write this as one vector so this vector that I wrote here, no, okay. Actually, I should have put an put. Okay, not this. Here, okay, I actually put that underscore. It is already there. So it it means that the original y that you have stacked up as a as a column vector. So y zero, y one, y two okay, is what you have. Hey, right? y zero, y one, y two, and we want to write this in terms of some matrix. Okay, multiplying x zero, x one because our input is only is on is basically non zero only at x0 and x1 so now if you simply write down so y0 okay if you if you see here so y0 from this equation is h0 x0 plus h1 x minus 1 correct and y1 will be um, h0 uh, x1 plus h1 x0 and then y2 as we can see is h0 x2 plus h1 x1 correct so then so, so if i try to try to fill this in so it's like h0 and then h1 x minus 1 but x minus 1 is 0 so i'll put a 0 there then y1 is h0 x1 sorry x0 h1 so h1 will come here and then x1 h0 so that goes there and y2 is uh, anyway right so x2 is 0 right so therefore this drops off and you get h1 x1 so you will get 0 and h1 right so this is for a for a very simple case right that i have kind of written but uh, but then you will kind of immediately identify some structure right in this matrix so this is what i mean by hx so i've written y in the form hx okay now what do you see about this matrix this has a particular name you all know about it what is it called Right? I'm surprised. I thought by now you would have. What is this matrix called? This is a name, no? A toplitz matrix. Correct. Right? This is called a toplitz matrix because if you look at it, right? I mean, so you should you should look at the look at the look at the off-diagonal entries. The off-diagonal entries will all be the same. So this has this is called a called a toplitz matrix. Okay, and this comes only because you have a you have a shift invariant property that is this time invariance okay not just linearity okay if you simply had linearity you would not see the structure okay because it's an lti you are seeing a toplitz matrix otherwise you will still see a matrix but then it won't have the structure okay now this structure you may wonder okay what what is its uh, significance and so on uh, but, but but right prior to that of course and to, and it doesn't just arise only with respect to lti systems and all if you had a whites and stationary process right there also you will see a toplitz, uh, you know, this kind of a structure. Okay, there are. So I'm saying, you know, this just happens to be that uh, for an LTI also it has this property. Okay. Now, uh, you know, what I want to do is, you know, I want to kind of express the same thing, but through but through another way. Okay, well, let's let us implement, you know, linear convolution via a circular convolution. Let's do the same thing, but then I want to come via a circular convolution. 
right what does that mean that means that we should actually zero pad right you know no how we do that so we zero pad both x and y, x and uh, h to the length of y and cyclically repeat them and then do a do a right so so what will you do now so you will take xn so i had said that it exists at 0 it exists at 1 and now we will sort of say that at 2 right we will uh, this is 1 by the way okay and then we again repeat it okay uh, it goes on and similarly from the left so minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 and then it goes on so this is like x0 x10 x0 x10 x0 x10 goes on similarly y and hn right will also have something like that right same thing whatever values will be different of course so now okay given this we can write yn okay if you want to implement through a circular convolution we can write this as m equal to 0 to 2 now and we can write this as h at uh, hm x of n minus m okay now you now you see y0 oh, sorry okay now let me just write like expand it in terms of n so yn is equal to h0 xn plus h1 xn minus 1 plus h2 xn minus 2 right okay i have taken it doesn't matter i mean last time i took h only no? all right okay so let us now expand this huh write it as uh, the next page will do so So what is it? So can you can you tell me what is y n? Then if I expand it, oops. Okay. Huh. So y zero. In fact, not y n. So y zero is h zero, x zero, plus h one, x minus one, plus h two, x minus two. Okay. Y one is h zero x1 if i make a mistake let me know h1 x0 plus h2 x of minus 1 and y2 is h0 x2 and there is a specific reason why i'm writing like this even though both the outputs are exactly identical plus h2 x of 0 correct and now i'm going to write this as y0 y1 y2 is equal to some matrix but now i'm going to write here x0 x1 x2 i'll write but then i know that i know that right, x2 is 0 but I'll, okay this i know is 0 this is simply a zero padded zero padded input so what do i do now so let me write this y0 as h0 x0 then h1 as a Okay, yeah, I think you know what. Yeah, it would have been. It would be actually better if you write in terms of. I mean, uh, okay, or else you know, or else you can look here. X of minus one is what? X of minus one is the same as X of two, right? So X of so X of two will have H one, right? Actually, we could have we could have written it directly, but anyway, right? So we'll write it here then, hmm? because for X of two, uh, X of minus one is to be interpreted as uh, this one, no? x of minus 1 is to be interpreted as x of 2 and for x of 2 we have here x of 2 for which it is it, it will be easy if you write it the other way around i think i okay then what about uh, h of 2 into x of minus 2 right and x of minus 2 is but uh, x of 1 okay but uh, h of 2 is 0 therefore this becomes 0 right then y1 okay h0 uh, what about this one h1 right h0 then x1 h0 plus x of minus 1 so x of minus 1 what would we say it is x2 right and therefore for x2 it is h2 but h2 is 0 correct then third is y2 so x2 uh, okay so here it goes h2 x0 uh, then x1 h1 and h2 x0 but h2 is 0 correct 
Now you see that this is also a Toeplitz matrix by the way, right? Look at all the all the diagonal and the off diagonal elements. This is a square matrix by the way. The earlier one was was rectangular. This this is three cross three multiplying three cross one giving you three cross one. But then this matrix is called actually circulant. Okay, this is this has even more structure than the earlier one. Okay, this is more structured than a Toeplitz. This one is actually circulant. This is a circulant matrix. Circulant in the, in the sense that every every row, right? If you take and then if you right shift cyclically, so you see H0, 0, H1, right shift cyclically, you'll get H1, H0, 0. Again, right shift cyclically, you'll get 0, H1, H0. If you shift that again, you'll back, you'll be back to the first row, right? Now there are there are matrices that are called retro circulant in the sense that you have to wrap them leftwards. Okay, then they become circulant. Okay, but these are these are not these are not retro. These are called circulant. Similarly, for for the other one also, you have you have you know things like uh, things like retro and so on. In fact, just out of interest, right? So so if you had the other way around, let me just ask. If you had if you had these elements to be constant, let's say this way. What would that be called? This we said is toplets. No, this way. Hey, this is toplets. Have you seen matrices that have entries this way that are identical? They won't be. They won't be similar this way. This way. Okay. Now what I mean is like this. See, these are not equal. No. Only these are equal, right? See, in this case, you're only these are equal, correct? This way, if I go. This way, it is not equal. But there are matrices for which. This way things are same. Okay, those are those are called and they are actually useful in hidden Markov models and so on. Okay, anyway. So for us, right now, okay, so this is like saying that y is equal to now same, right? Hx, but now this is a circulant matrix. Okay. And uh, and when we write it in this form, there is there is there is one one very interesting property. Uh, do you do, have you heard of normal matrix? Huh? Huh. Yeah, uh, what is a normal matrix? When do you say that a matrix is normal? Let's say a matrix A. How do I check whether it is normal? Normal means not like abnormal versus normal. Normal. Just as you have Gaussian normality, right? This normal has a, has a different... Yeah, please. Tell now. What, what is the... How do you... I thought you said something. Huh? Very good. A transpose is equal to A transpose A, right? Okay, when this happens, okay, you you say that you say that right, a matrix is normal. So for the time being, right now, what is interesting is that uh, you can check that a Toeplitz matrix will not will not actually satisfy this in general, whereas a circulant will. Okay, I mean, I, I can do this here, but then you can just check it out. Just take a, take a, see three cross three, right? So 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 do something like A is equal to A B C. Now, if I want a kind of toplets, right, I will have to do something like D, A, B, then I may have to write E, D, A. Hmm. This will be a toplets matrix, right? Now, do this, check this A transpose. So, A transpose is what? Okay, A, D, E, B, A, D, C, B, A, right? Now, multiply the two. So, your first element is what? A square plus, plus, plus B square plus C square, right? If you do A, A transpose. You do A transpose A, your first element is what? A square plus D square plus E square, no? So here itself you can see, right? Whereas if you had something like, some like, you know, some like circulant, okay, where if you now make it circulant, you'll have what? A, B, C, C, A, B, B, C, A. Now, now you can check. Of course, you know, this doesn't mean that they are symmetric. Okay, circulant, toplets and all need not in general be symmetric and also you'll get like A, C, B, right? B, A, C. C B A, right? So in general, in general, okay, they are not, they are not, you know, symmetric. But now you can check that. Uh, I just leave it to you. Just verify that, you know, that uh, circulant matrix is normal. Every circulant matrix is in fact normal. That means it will satisfy this law. And and what the implications of this are, we will see later. Okay. Now for us, okay, it just suffices to sort of understand as to okay. Now if we can say all the, all of this about a one D LTI system that uh, that you can relate. You know it through a circular matrix, uh, right? Of uh, you know in this manner, what would happen if we had 
if you had a, a, no, a 2D system now instead of 1D, then what does it mean to have? So, so if I wanted to write the input and the output, right? Should I write a matrix, uh, and or should I write out a vector and then and then have a have a matrix that will multiply a vector? Then if it's a vector, then what is that vector? How what is its relation to the original image and so on, right? Because that's what will happen. No, now when you when you're looking now, suppose we want to see with respect to 2D what will happen for a 1D LTE system. You get a you get a you know, toplitz matrix, or if you write it in this manner, you'll get a circle and matrix. So that has certain properties. In fact, your variability to go and and express in terms of Fourier coefficients, we arrive. We say you know convolution leads to leads to products right in the Fourier domain. That it's so this so that itself happens because of the circle and nature of this matrix. If it turns out that a, that a, that a DFT matrix is the guy which will diagonalize this actually. I mean that's why a DFT matrix has a special Sort of a special wrapper, which with a with a circle with 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 circle and matrices, it bears a special significance for circle and matrices. Similarly, right, we want to understand when it, when you go to two D, I mean that is where all of this will come in, but not now. But why the circle and and uh, no, why are we doing this? You will realize the significance later. But what we are now asking is, if instead of this, suppose I had, I had a, I had a two D system. I call this H of M comma N, and then X of M comma N goes in. Right, and then y of m comma n comes out, which is an image. Now all of this is an image. Now I want to see whether I can whether I can relate the input and the output in a kind of a matrix vector form. And if I do that, then what will be that matrix? What structure will that have? Can that be related to the 1D case and so on? Right? That is the thing that we want to do next.